All right, hello everyone and happy Monday. Welcome to On The Menu. Um, today's event is brought to you by Barnes and Thornburg LLP. So shout out to them. So how many content creators do we have in the room currently? If you're creating content for a brand, okay, we've got a few. What about people who are wanting to go into that direction? Okay, kind of, I'm sure. Okay, maybe this will help you figure that out. Um, I'm really excited about today. I have a very fancy iPhone. I've got two cameras up there. I hardly know how to use it. So hopefully these tips and tricks can help um, all of us today. So my name is Alicia Josie and I'm the program coordinator here. So if you come to Frontier Events, you most likely will see me. Um, for this month's On The Menu topic, we brought in Linda Wynn to lead our session. She's a full-time content creator and portrait photographer. She has built a personal brand as a food and travel influencer. She's also, she also has a photography business where she helps people capture their personal and business stories. So let's welcome Linda. Thank you guys. Can you hear me? Do I have to hold the oh. mic? <laughs> <laughs> Let me know if you can't hear me because I talk with my hands and I'm afraid that if I carry a mic, then um, we'll have the echo. All right. Let's see. So my name is Linda and we are chatting about some photography techniques to apply to your social media feeds. Um, how many of you use a professional camera? Uh, can you actually use the mic? Okay. Oh, no, no, it's good. I'll try. Can you hear me yes. better? Okay. How many of you guys use a professional camera? Okay. Professional. It's getting closer and closer. This is perfect. Um, I didn't think that everyone will have a professional camera, so I geared this talk for anyone, including people who just use their phones. Okay, and a little bit about me. My name is Linda. Um, I have been creating content online since I was 15 years old. I'm 39, almost 39, so it's been a long time. If you guys have been around um, when GeoCities was around, I was creating websites on GeoCities. And um, I've just been doing this since before the word blogging was even a word. Um, I also, have because of my content creation and internet journey have also evolved to be a photographer because a lot of showing up online involves taking photos. So why should you care about improving your photography? Well, we are so visual and not only are we visual as human beings, but if you've been online for a while, all the social media platforms have evolved and our brains have evolved to have shorter and shorter attention spans. So not a lot of people are taking the time to read your carefully crafted captions or your long form content. And sometimes your photos are your first, literally your first and only impression. So your goal is to use your photos to pull your people in. So you can use your photos to create a story, you can use your imagery to evoke emotion, which is powerful in your marketing. And then you can also use it as an opportunity for your, for your followers or your audience to find you and connect with you by showing up yourself. And if you recognize that's actually from this building. Okay, so we're gonna go into photography tips and this is, especially also good for your phone camera. So you, anyone can use these tips. So lighting, we can teach an entire course on lighting. We're not gonna do that. So we're just gonna do some basic lighting tips for the everyday beginner photographer. Um, most photographers will agree that lighting is probably the most important element in your photo. You can have the most beautiful setup and if the lighting's terrible, it's not going to, it's not going to be conveyed to your viewer. So here are some very short lighting um, tips for beginners. If you're indoors, your best bet is to find the window 
And not only do you find the window, I find the most pleasing generic lighting is to light your subject from the side. So tater tots, push them to the side. Don't actually do backlighting. I feel like when you're new to photography, the instinct is just find the window and stand in front of it and take a photo. Um, usually that creates this, if you're not modifying your light and you're just using that window, it just creates this blown out background and the subject is dark and you lose a little detail. So one way you can fix that in an everyday setting without any gear is just to move your subject to the side. So have the window touch your subject side and that creates a more pleasing look. Um, if you look at the photo of me, it's a cell phone photo. One side of my face is a little darker and we can talk about how to modify that um, in a basic sense in the next slide. So here are some light modification tips for beginners. If you're shooting at home, you can buy poster board or white foam board or anything white. You can use a white sheet if you have someone to help you hold it up um, and use that to modify your light. So you don't even need gear to do this. So for this photo, this cutie, um, the house was actually really dark. And so I just went to the window and I turned off all my lights. If you're using a professional camera, if turning off your lights can help not mix the colors of your lights. So that's another tip. Um, so I turn off all the lights in the room so that we only had one color of the natural light. And then the curtains were white. So I wrapped the white curtains and instead of a poster board, I used the white curtains to kind of bounce the light back. So what would happen is the subject is right here. The window's right here. If you have that poster board or something white, the light will light that side of that face and then it will hit your white surface and bounce back into the subject. So you can see his face is more evenly lit than the other photo where I was at a darker side. Um, it's not always gonna be 100% even and I prefer that. Um, it makes it a little bit more natural so you don't feel like you're in a studio setting, but it does kind of makes it less distracting the contrast between one side and the other side. Um, if you really want to get creative, you can also buy black foam poster board or boards. And this is the opposite of white. It will, instead of reflect light, it will absorb light. So it creates a more dramatic shadow. So if you're at home and you're taking photos of your lunch, you can play around with the boards that you may have at home or any surfaces you have at home. Okay. So another thing I find um, that is a common mistake with new photographers and people who aren't intentionally taking photos is assuming a sunny day with no clouds is a beautiful day. And it's beautiful for the naked eye. And I always feel like a grumpy person whenever it's sunny and I'm like, oh, I hate today. And it's because <laughs> I want a little soft light, a diffused light. So cloudy days for photographers are amazing because it diffuses the light and it's not so harsh. So one thing you can do, um, if you're gonna do outside photo shoots, try to avoid on a clear day, noon. Noon is the harshest light, it's right above you. It creates unflattering shadows, especially if you're photographing people and you want people to feel their best and they're not squinting. So um, if you do have to take photos during, the, during noon, which sometimes I have to as a photographer, um, what I do is I find probably like the edges of things, buildings, trees, and they cast a shadow um, and you can evenly light your subject that way. Again, this is for beginner photographers. Um, there's nothing wrong with direct sun, especially if you know, if you're intentionally using it and creating more editorial looks, but this is for the basic beginning photographers who just want to look nice and feel nice. Um, so for this photo, I was actually on the rooftop of unscripted parking lot and there was no shade. So I squished my clients against the wall and made them sit on the floor <laughs> so they can have an even light on their face. So you just have to be a little creative sometimes. So one last tip with our basic lighting segment um, is if you're out and about and you don't know where to find the best light, what you can do is grab your cell phone, put it on selfie mode, put it in front of your face and give, your, give yourself admiration <laughs> and then twirl. So as you're twirling a little bit and pivoting your body, 
he can see the light on your face will change. And this is an easy hack that even professional photographers use when they're on location, they can't really figure out where the direction of light's coming from. Um, and when you do this, you'll see and notice when your face is the most, um, has the most flattering light on you. And that's your, your hack on finding the best light and direction of light. So that concludes our lighting segment of this chat. We are going to enter composition. And composition is something you can use no matter what camera you use, including cell phones. Um, so the first concept we're going to cover is called rule of thirds. So rule of thirds is if you're looking through your frame, you want to divide your frame or your canvas into three sections. I don't know how to verbally demonstrate that. So here's a photo. <laughs> and those are the three lines, or not the three lines, but the three sections, you want to align your subject along the lines on the grid. And this just creates a more pleasing composition sometimes. Um, I feel like when you're entering photography or you're not thinking about it from a beginner standpoint, everyone's uh, first basic instinct is to center everything. And sometimes that works. Um, but if you want to play around and create more dynamic photos, you can use rule of thirds. And this kind of um, what it does is when you're looking at your photos, that empty space, it can create some lines and you can, yes. So those four intersections are called PowerPoints. Thank you. I didn't have the term. That's the reason why PowerPoint is called PowerPoint. I didn't know that. You can teach this class. <laughs> um, here are some more examples. Here's another frame. Um, there is a couple of leading lines in this photos, and we can talk about leading lines in the next section. Um, but this is, again, how you can divide up into rule of thirds. Here's a cell phone photo of some chickens on a farm. Um, another thing you can do with rule of thirds or consider it is when you're taking photos, another basic instinct is to put your horizon in the center. But this rule kind of challenges you to take create more pleasing photos by kind of shifting the horizon up. And again, just shift it up to um, the first line in the, in the grid. Again, it's just more pleasing. When you start taking photos, you can actually experiment and compare a photo not using that rule and a photo after, and you'll find yourself a little bit more drawn to the photos with the rule of thirds being applied. Yes. One thing that uh, photograph captured also uh, that I learned was you're supposed to let a little bit of the image go off the page for the imagination. Yeah. And you're doing that with a vehicle, whether it's on, on purpose or not, I don't know. Right. But that's a technique to help uh, draw attention. Exactly. So that's perfectly um, stated that that tractor, I don't know, that's not a tractor, <laughs> that vehicle is facing a certain way. Same with people. If it was a person, you want them looking to the empty space. Um, it will look weird if the photo ended here and there's empty space behind me. It's just, it's not, doesn't make sense to your story. So he's um, exactly correct. You can make sure whatever you have that has like a front facing thing to face the more empty space of your frame. Okay, so we mentioned leading lines earlier. So leading lines are exactly what they sound like. There are lines that kind of lead your eye to a certain part of your photo. Um, if I were to crit critique my own photo, I would have shifted my subject a little bit closer to the center so that the leading lines more neatly converge to them. So you see leading lines up top and then you see leading lines in the sidewalk pathway. And this concept is basically, again, it's like a psychological, quiet, um, subtle hint for your eyes to find where the lines are leading you. You can find leading lines pretty much um, everywhere when you start looking for them. So when I'm on a shoot with, uh, with a client, I'll look for fences, um, sidewalks, hallways will create nice leading lines. These are easy leading lines. Um, some landscape photographers are amazing with their landscape, with their leading lines. They're able to find curvy lines in nature and I don't, my brain doesn't think that way. So I don't have photos of that, but um, railroads are often used for leading lines. I do want to say that it triggers a lot of photographers. If you photograph people on railroad tracks, make sure that they're abandoned and not in use <laughs> because it's, it's, it needs to be said, a lot of people do love taking photos on railroad tracks, but it is dangerous. Trains are a lot quieter than you think they are. So make sure they're overgrown and out of business. 
Okay, so another thing you can look for in your photos are some repeating patterns. Again, that just kind of create this sense of um, order for you. Um, so uh, the potted plants immediately drew me in. I was grabbing coffee at Cloche Coffee in Durham. So that's a cute little coffee shop if you haven't been. They have really pretty plants for sale and my eyes immediately were drawn to it. So I had to photograph it. Um, and then if you have products in your service and your businesses that are able to be stacked in a certain way or ordered in a certain way, that's another concept you can play with in your social media content creation. Okay, so a negative space is probably one of my favorite things to use in my photos. Um, it, I don't know about you, but when you're scrolling on Instagram or on TikTok, Sometimes you just feel so overstimulated without realizing you're feeling overstimulated. And a lot of it is just, of course, the volume of content we're consuming, but also the imagery. And then what I notice is as I'm scrolling, every now and then I'll come across a very um, pleasing photo that has a lot of negative space. And I find myself take a deep breath and it's because your brain's like, ah, some room to breathe. So you're able to actually create this for your viewers and give them some room to feel and to breathe by creating more negative space in your photos. So um, the cocktail, the pineapple cocktail, I actually had it inside of a restaurant and it's just the photo would have been great, message would have been clear, but taking it outside and having a clear blue sky and some ocean really adds to the vacation vibes that you might wanna convey with your photos. And then the cute little baby, the negative space, um, kind of for me calls into attention how tiny the baby is <laughs> so if you were to get a little closer the perspective of the baby may not feel as vulnerable and tiny and cute um, but if you were to pull out some more then you have some space to kind of convey just how teeny tiny a newborn is um, and then you can really get kind of deep if you want the space could symbolize the future ahead of this baby, you can just really work with some negative space to kind of convey a certain kind of mood or feeling. Um, and I don't really have anything deep to say about the smoothie bowl, except that it's pleasing to the eye with the negative space and the colors. Yes. Someone online messaged and asked, what exactly is negative space? Negative space is space in your photos that don't have um, an object in it. So in the first photo, the negative space is the blue sky. Negative space in the second photo is the white sheets. There's nothing in it occupy, occupying space. And in the third photo, it's the table, maybe a little bit of the chair, but mostly the table. Negative space is empty space in your photos. Another thing about negative space is it's also very practical for your content creation and social media marketing. And it's because you can add text to it more easily. Sometimes when you're creating content for your business, you need like headers and titles and you're looking through your photos and there's some really great photos, but once you add text to it, it just doesn't fit. And you end up having to do things like add a blank white box to your photo, which takes away from your photos. So one thing you can do is when you start planning your feed to um, plan some shots with negative spots, I mean, negative space, so that you have um, photos that you can use for copywriting and, and adding text. Okay, so background and foreground. Um, I have two things to say about it. One is um, this happens to me <laughs> when I'm at an event, sometimes with auditorium seating or at a wedding, and you're just feeling the vibes and you wanna take photos of yourself. So you hand your phone off, they take their photo and you give it back, they get, you get it back and you look at it and there's like someone walking right behind you and their butt is next to your face or their crotch is right next to your face. And it's because when you take photos, sometimes you're so focused on your subject that you ignore what's in frame. So that's the first thing I wanna say is double check your frame. You're taking photos of your lunch because it's something you wanna remember. Is there any, clutter in the front or clutter in the back that you can move out your shot, things that will distract from the story. So that's one thing. Um, if you're taking photos for people, tell them, you know, let's just wait one second and let someone <laughs> walk by you. Um, tell them, because it is awkward just to be standing there and waiting, because I have to do that all the time. And I'm like, just, just hold that pose. Um, another thing I want to say about using your background and foreground is not only make sure that there's nothing distracting your photo from, um, from your photo and your object, but also maybe you can use it to tell a better story. So I was hired by Cavassier to take 
a photo of their cognac. And I could have just kind of phoned it in and just take a photo of the bottle itself, but I wanted to build a little bit of a vibe, a little bit of a story. So I created a leading line with the ornaments that directed to the bottle. Um, a little bit of the ornaments are in the foreground. Um, I put a tree in the background to kind of tell the story that maybe you can enjoy and sip on it um, on a glass while you are home listening to Christmas music and, and decorating your trees. So you can really use your, your background and your foreground to tell a more complete story or add context. So here are some examples. Um, the, the subject is, I think it's fried fish and rice from Stir in North Hills. And I could have taken that photo. I call it the safe shot. The safe shot is the isolated shot. Um, it is useful for things like menus or grandmas really love photos of their grandchildren just looking straight at camera centered. Those are your safe shots. But then you can kind of play around with your background and foreground. So had my partner in the back. It tells a story of what's the lunch date maybe. Um, the second photo, the focus and the star is the matcha mousse cake. I love matcha. So I wanted to focus and um, do a tour of matcha desserts around the triangle. The photo would have been nice without it. It would have you know, completed a story, but I wanted a little bit more context, like a Sally Cafe and Carrie, they don't only just have matcha desserts, they have other desserts. And although I'm not talking about them, I can allude to them by using them in the background and kind of blurring them out. The last example, I kind of wish I had a better um, photo of this where the, the building was in focus, but just imagine the building is in focus and the flowers are not. The flowers in the foreground add to the vibe of that photo. It's now not only just a tea house, it's a honeysuckle tea house, I think, in Chapel Hill. But adding the flowers kind of give it a romantic feel, uh, um, romantic feel and also maybe like a summer feel. So you can really add to your messaging by playing with your foreground and background. Okay, so another thing you can do is get a little handsy with your photos. Um, I took the safe shot of the chicken sandwich, you know, just the chicken sandwich, safe shot. But having my friend pick up the sandwich kind of made it a little bit more inviting to me. When you can add a human element to your photo, I think it really decreases the amount of emotional space between the viewer and the photo. They can start imagining themselves enjoying that sandwich or um, using that juicer. So um, I could have taken that juicer photo and just leave it at that, maybe add some lime and lemon to add to the context. But having someone using it, again, use it, um, demonstrating your product kind of creates a little bit more of um, connection with your photo from the viewer. With the baby, the baby, again, with the cute little stuffed animals would have been a perfect photo, cute message gets, gets um, given, but adding their parents' hands to the photo kind of also completes a better story. This baby is well loved. Um, the parents are married because you can see the wedding ring. So there's all these little context clues you can add in with just adding some hands. Which brings us to movement. Um, after you take your safe shots uh, and your isolated shots, you can start being creative. I say that because sometimes I have to catch myself to remember to take the safe shots because sometimes after you play with your, your set, it's no longer, the safe shot's no longer available to you. So make sure you take your plain safe photos first and then you can start playing around. Um, I do a lot of food in lifestyle product photography. So for me, movement could be pouring of something, syrup, drinks, stirring, um, and cheese pulls are also very popular in the food photography movement um, scene. And then for people, for my portrait sessions, after we do the safe shots, I don't forget about them. We can have the clients kind of interact with each other, laugh, interact with the environment. Um, kids love being tickled. I have them get tickled by their parents. Yes. Always, uh, need to look into the camera, yeah, so that's a good question. So for me, safe shots are people looking at the camera smiling. And then after you get that safe shot, because grandma us usually loves those safe shots, um, you can start playing with it and look off camera. That's actually a really easy posing prompt. Once you have someone look at the camera, you can tell them, look to the side, look to the other side, giggle. Um, I usually prompt my 
my clients by making a terrible laugh, like, ha, 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 ha. And then it kind of gets them to laugh at me. And the laughing also is um, a great prompt for people photography because laughing sometimes at the height of your laugh, you may not look photogenic because I, I was like scrunch up my face, but when the laugh kind of relaxes a little bit, you get the genuine smiles and the genuine smile is definitely different from a can't like a pose smile. Yeah. There's different muscles being used. Um, but yes, you never want to capture people. You want to shoot through it. You probably don't want to deliver the photo of them at the height of their laughter because it's scrunched up face, scrunched up neck. I don't really like the way they look, but when the laugh relaxes, that's usually the money, the money shot. Okay. Um, speaking of, since we're more geared towards social media content, um, one thing I notice some of my, um, I do this mistake too, so I'm not, I'm also preaching to myself, is a lot of people hide behind their services and products. Meaning, um, for instance, how I feel is I have two social media accounts. Um, one is for my photography. My photography account, you can never see my face. I rarely show my face, but I wanna encourage you to show your face because people want to buy and hire the people they know. And if they feel like they don't know you, they're not gonna wanna, they won't, they may not connect with you and they want to feel connected to whoever they're, they're buying from or hiring. So I definitely need to take my own advice. Um, but when you get a chance, if you are the face of your personal brand or you're the face of your products and services, try to introduce yourself, take photos, um, use all the other techniques we talked about and put yourself in front of the camera so that people can connect um, with you because studies do show that people are more likely to pay attention when there's a face in the photo. Um, and if, yes. So with that, you know, if you're learning now, I still know how to do this. If you're getting, you know, Yeah, so I do this all the time because most of my friends are not um, photographers and I show up on my food account. I may fail my photography account, but I show up on my food account. What you do is, um, here's a tip. If you're with somebody, it's easy. You, you pose them. So if I want a photo of myself um, in this patio, I will have them sit the way I want to be sit seating. And this is a great way for you to conceptualize the concept as well, because sometimes you have an idea in your, in your mind, but um, in reality, it just doesn't go well. So you're able to model them the way and, and workshop it with them. You take that photo, you note where you're standing and where you're leveled, and then you tell them to come to you so they don't have to remember where you're standing. Tell them, stand right here. This is the photo I want. This is where you're sitting is where I want to be sitting. And can you help me direct so that I look like this? Sometimes um, it might take a couple of tries, but that's an easy way to just hand off your camera to somebody um, after you pose them. And it, it's a great way to kind of workshop it too, because when you're shooting it by yourself, which I have done with a tripod, it's, it takes a little bit more guesswork because again, what you envision may not be what's actually happening in real life. So when you have a buddy, you can pose them. If you're taking photos by yourself, bring a tripod. It just may take a little bit more time. Um, some people on TikTok say that they just do video. So they post their, they put their tripod up, they put it on video, and then they pose and they just move through the poses and kind of play with it. And then they're able to screenshot from video. As a ph professional photographer, I don't do that because it kind of irks me to work from a screenshot. But if you're just creating content for your brand and you aren't a professional photographer, that's another hack that I've seen people do is just set up video and, and kind of move through it and you're able to, to screenshot. My tip for video, if you're going to do that, is to take your time so that's easier to screenshot because if, <laughs> if your shot that you want is just like half a second long, it's going to be really hard for you to find that screenshot and screenshot it. So just be slow and deliberate and, and you'll be able to grab some photos of yourself, which you should do. And if you are not the face of your a brand, um, still use people. And for me, for my photography, um, one thing you can do is also try to be inclusive and diverse in your feed. So um, try to have multiple kinds of people and demographics in your marketing and show different kinds of people. Um, sometimes I feel like we just aren't aware that our circle is, so it looks just one way, but you can expand and, and take that into account when you're showing people. 
because we're focused on social media. I think the most popular social media platform still is Instagram and TikTok now. Um, when you're creating content for social media, particularly Instagram and TikTok, the feed is vertical. So try to avoid posting horizontal photos. The reason being is it will take up less space of your phone. So you're less likely to pull in someone who's passing through on their feed. So you just wanna take up as much space as you can. I have heard that Instagram is actually moving towards an even more narrow um, aspect ratio. They're actually squeezing it to nine by 16, which is your entire phone. So it's just leaning, the trends are leaning that you should post vertical content so that you can maximize the space on the phone that your, your um, audience is using. Wait, actually one more break. But don't make my mistake. I've made a mistake of being so focused a few years ago on creating Instagram account that I just completely like, forgot to take landscape photos. So you still need your landscape photos for other platforms like news, email newsletters, um, blog posts, articles, press releases, horizontal photos are still um, useful. I'm just saying don't post them on your Instagram. Okay. So what do you do with all of this, especially if you have never considered photography or um, considered improving your content creation? This can be overwhelming. I just gave you a whole bunch of things to think about. Um, but my philosophy is the more you practice, the more you show up, it just becomes a little bit more instinctual and you start learning tips of your own and tricks of your own. Um, also, try not to be so precious with your journey with photography and create um, content creation. Posting a horizontal photo is better than not posting a photo. So just show up and um, you are able to, by showing up, you're able to develop that voice and that style. And it just takes um, a lot of, a little bit of a grind, which brings me to my favorite quote about being a beginner and being a creative. nobody uh, tells people who are beginners, and I really wish somebody had told this to me, is that um, all of us who do creative work, like, you know, we get into it, and we get into it because we have good taste, but it's like there's a gap that for the first couple of years that you're making stuff, what you're making isn't so good, okay? It's not that great. It's, it's, it's trying to be good. It has ambition to be good, but it's not quite that good, but your taste the thing that got you into the game, your, your taste is still killer. And your taste is good enough that you can tell that what you're making is kind of a disappointment to you. You know what I mean? A lot of people never get past that phase. A lot of people at that point, they quit. And the thing I, I would just like say to you with all my heart is that m most everybody I know who does interesting creative work, they went through a phase of years where they had really good taste, they could tell what they were making wasn't as good as they wanted it to be. They knew it felt short. It didn't have this special thing that we wanted it to have. And the thing I would say to you is everybody goes through that. And for you to go through it, if you're going through it right now, if you're just getting out of that phase, you gotta know it's totally normal. And the most important possible thing you could do is do a lot of work, do a huge volume of work. Put yourself on a deadline so that every week or every month you know you're gonna finish one story. Because it's only by actually going through a volume of work that you're actually going to ca catch up and close that gap. And your, the work you're making will be as good as your ambitions. In my case, like I, I took longer to figure out how to do this than anybody I've ever met. It takes a while. It's going to take you a while. It's normal to take a while. And you just have to fight your way through that. Okay. Do you have any questions for me? 
I have enjoyed my time with you. Yes. Question. So you've taken us through some of the different um, types of tips you can use when taking a photo, like negative space, um, the leading lines. So whenever you are creating content on, let's say, your Linda Eats World account, do you try and just do a mix or do you have like a, a formula that you use to decide how many to put? Um, no, I don't have a formula. I will say when I was working or when I am working professional shoots, I try to have a plan, a, sh a shot list. Um, sometimes the plan falls away and I can't use any of my envisioned plans, um, because maybe the location isn't how I thought it was going to be, et cetera. But, um, you can do that by maybe doodling in a, a pad. Like this is what a shot that I want, because sometimes when you're in the moment, especially for me, I'm, I'm a high on the quick start. And so I get in flow and I forget to check my shot list and I might miss that central shot that is essential to the shoot. So create a list and um, the night before. And, um, when you know, when you start practicing these techniques, if you do it on your own time, you just kind of developed, um, a muscle memory for it and you'll start naturally looking. So as I'm walking down the street, I can't help. My friends will know, like I'm walking down the street and I'll be like, I wish someone in a beautiful dress is right in front of me so I can make them stand right in that corner and take that photo. So you'll start noticing your surroundings when you're driving. You'll be like, oh, that wall would have been perfect for this. Um, when you're, for me, I do a lot of content creation at, at restaurants and I can't plan for crowds or um, sometimes I don't know what they look like because I don't have their photos online yet. So what I just do is just like scan the room, like where's the window, where, um, what's busy, where's the light coming from? And then I try to plan for that. If you're in the food space, which I am, um, and I'm creating, a, I'm doing a reservation, I might um, put a little note, be like, if possible, please seat me by a window. Um, I would like to take photos, you know, like just do what you can to prep. Um, for me, what's been helpful is um, checklists because I do have a tendency to just enter a flow state and just forget the list. So the list is a good check. Um, and then you just look for opportunities to use these techniques when you're out and about or taking photos. It, it, obviously, obviously it's a little easier when you're at home, you have the white phone board and all the time in the world to kind of play with it. So, you know, the more you do it, the more muscle memory you'll build and some instincts for it. Yes. Any tips regarding the iPhone? I, um, I used to be an Android. I just got my first iPhone. Um, I really love my iPhone. It's iPhone 13. I think these tips are great for all, um, cameras, including cell phone cameras. Cause I've been using a really old Samsung, um, for a long time. Cause lighting actually, you can fake a good camera with good light. <laughs> so if you take a photo with the window light during the day versus the same shot at night on the cell phone, it's very obvious it's a cell phone when you're taking it that light. So you can fake a lot of good shots, um, professional looking shots with just focusing on your light and making sure that, um, cause what happens is when <laughs> we're just going to get into the weeds here, when it's dark, um, depending on your camera, if you're using auto, what happens is because the camera is working hard to fill in the information with, with the lack of light, it gets really grainy. Um, so if you're, if you're not bringing in any light or if you're working with low light, the, the crappier the phone, it'll show the grain. Um, so one way you can combat that is, is, um, attending to your light and shooting during the day. Yes. 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 So I took, um, let me go back to this so I can. Yes, I use professional cameras for all this. You can, with the iPhone, um, now that I'm getting accustomed to the iPhone 13, they have a portrait mode and a portrait mode, you can actually play with that to kind of blur out your background. Um, some tips on blurring out your background. If you want to blur background and you don't really know how to do it, the more distance between the subject and the background will create a blur and your phone will sometimes naturally do that. So I find that, um, again, you, you start noticing what is um, the initial instinct and why it's, it's wrong. The initial instinct for people to take photo with this blue wall is to get right up against it. And this has no space. So your background won't separate from you. It'll just be in focus. But one way you can fake it um, with a cell phone is get as far as you can 
and the, the wall will be naturally blurred because your camera will realize that you are the subject and blur the background. So your instinct is to get up against the background. It's the wrong instinct if you want the blurred background. If you want it to be part of your photo, then get close to it, but more distance, more blur. Yes. So I don't have any right now. I have um, a few. There's a woman on YouTube. She's Jessica Whitaker. I used to follow her and I love working from her and watching um, her pose her portrait photography. She's a portrait photographer. Um, I typically get my education by consuming content intentionally. So when you're consuming content, you'll notice, oh, that photo is boring, this photo, I love this photo. So anytime you have a strong emotion, if it's negative or, or positive, even if it's negative, ask yourself, why don't I like this photo? And then you can train yourself to be a better photographer. So for me, I'd be like, oh, this person's looking to the left when they really should be looking to the right because it's framed with empty space to the right. Or, hey, the lighting on this is, is terrible. Oh, hey, I really loved how they used the foreground to add to this story. So as you're consuming content, you can actually teach yourself to be a better photographer because you can work your way backwards. Like, why do I love this? Why, why is this photo pulling at me? And then break it down from there. And then use YouTube. YouTube is, um, YouTube is how I learned Photoshop. So anytime you have a question, once you have a photo that you love, let's say the blurred background and you don't know how to do it on whatever camera you're using, Type in the camera you're using, blurred background, and they'll have tons of people teaching you how to do it. So the education is out there and free and available at the University of YouTube. <laughs> yes. How did you make your business? How did you make a business out of your passion? Okay, so that is a long story. Um, it took me a long time. I got laid off from my last nine to five in 2013. I took my first paid photo in 2016. Um, my advice is to not quit your day job. I was forced out of my day job by being laid off, but don't, but intentionally creating the work that you want to um, be paid for. So if you want to be a photographer, start posting photos that you want to be paid for. If you want to be a travel content creator, start taking trips and taking those photos and showing up as the person you want to be hired for. So that's my first tip. Second tip is um, just by showing up even when you're terrible, like Ira Glass says, like I, gosh, I've taken some terrible photos, so bad. Um, I learned photography. One of the reasons why I learned how to use a camera in a manual mode. So I got on Twitter, I don't remember what year it was. And I said, I'm gonna take 10 terrible photos a day for 30 days and I'm gonna post them on my Tumblr. And this man I've never met from Canada saw my tweet <laughs> and gave me homework for 30 days. So. First day, he was like, hey, we're going to focus on aperture. Second day, he was like, we're going to focus on exposure. And this, I share the story, not that you can find your own Canadian stranger man to teach you. <laughs> but when you show up, even when it's scary, even when your work isn't as good as you you wish it to be, you don't know who's connecting with you. Maybe there's someone along the lines who's ahead of you who's already who's already retired and doesn't know what to do and is connecting with your story because they remind you of your younger self and they're really able to guide you. And the only way you can find help because no one does it by themselves is if, if you have the guts to kind of show up um, in public and kind of fail and fumble in public. You have a question? Yes. Yeah, um, maybe off topic, I'm not sure. But, um, what about the unposed uh, real life yeah. capturing yes. the moment? Yes. So um, I'm thinking you're mainly talking about people, humans, portraits, uh, candidates. Well, even, I mean, nature's oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I'm not outside because I'm such a city person. Um, but yes. So for I'm going to talk to you about um, portrait photography, because that's what I know. Um, for people, for the candid shots, I take the safe shots and then my favorite shots are usually the moments in between. So um, let your, your clients or your, or your friends and family be natural and be themselves. And you just kind of like stay to the edge of the room and just kind of keep continue to shoot. If you're, if you're taking professional photos and you want to have that, that moment captured, have some prompts that um, 
that will lead to that kind of interaction. So for me, if it's a couple's, I will have them look into each other's eyes. They hate it because they are so uncomfortable. I have them look into each other's eyes and I'm, and I'm like, hey, Ted, can you compliment Elizabeth? Give her a compliment. And you don't even have to say it so that I can hear. Maybe you can whisper in her ear. And so he'll get in there. He'll whisper something about her butt. And then she'll like <laughs> smack him because, you know, she's embarrassed that she's talking about her butt in front of the photographer. And then I'm sitting there just snapping through it. Um, kids, um, a great way to get them to have that candid moment because they hate sitting still. I try to get that as fast as I can. And then I'll do things like, um, is he ticklish? Um, do you want to chase dad? Um, maybe we can play ring around the rosy. So it's really great to have that movement and those prompts because um, people hate, I hate being in front of the camera. I hate it because you never know what you're looking like. But if you're giving someone something to interact with or an action, it kind of takes them out of that moment and they're able to be themselves. Um, and then you can just tweak it as you go. Like, oh, that's so sweet that you said that, but can you say it again? Cause I missed the shot, like just snap through it. So that's one way you can kind of engineer a little bit of can candid photos. Okay, any more questions? We'll go. Um, so I know um, I'm a long picture, but I don't know where you got the white this board, are you that right outside of the frame? So, um, yes, right outside the frame, because you don't want the whiteboard to be in your photo. So I do that a lot with food. I don't, I can't find the photo. So <laughs> basically, um, you want it out of the frame because you don't want the whiteboard. You can always cut it, you can crop it. Sometimes it's just hard to like back yourself in a certain way where it's on shot. So you obviously want to cut it out because that's really distracting. Um, I will say that you can find natural reflectors out in the world. So if you are taking photos and there's a white wall, you can have them stand against the wall um, and maybe the light's coming this way. And then the white wall is naturally giving them a reflection on their face. So um, there's one thing you can look for is like, hey, how, how do I evenly light this without buying any gear? And it's like, is there anything around me that is light color that can reflect some light? And that's one thing you can do. Oh yeah, you can definitely play. You'll see it. You can do it with cell phones too. I I have the iPhone 13 has spoiled me, so I've been using that a lot more. Um, you definitely see the difference in your shadows if you buy a little dollar poster board. You'll set up a scene. There's a window right here, and you just put up the board with. Sometimes I just use one hand and take a photo on the other um, and you'll see the difference. You can take a photo before and after and it'll just even out some of the shadows that you see because it's bouncing light back. Yeah. yeah, you can use a mirror. A mirror tends to be a little bit more focused. So white is a little bit more gentle and diffuse. Um, some people use um, gold um, reflective and that kind of makes the light a little warmer. So if you use white, it's just a natural white color um, light fill light that some pe some photographers actually bring gear and they can color um, the light that's coming back and gel it but we're talking the basics today <laughs> yes yes um if you have a tripod a 20 dollar tripod from amazon for your phone i still use it and i'm on the professional, I still use my <laughs> phone um, tripod. So that's one way you can do it is set the scene. A lot of it um, is courage because it can feel really embarrassing to be out in public and a tripod by yourself and taking photos. But this is a good exercise in taking up space and not caring what people think. Um, you set up the tripod, you take the photo. Um, some The tripod, the cheap $20 um, tripods now have um, Bluetooth wireless remote, you can use that, or you can set a timer. I've done timers just because I, I, I always lose the remotes. <laughs> um, find a timer. And um, the TikTok tip I talked about that a lot of younger generations do is they just put it on video and you can move through your poses and screenshot from your video if you are, that way you're not running back and forth. So there is some pros of using video screenshots. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it really does. Then you can, the hardest part for me is just doing it in public and just feeling okay with maybe looking a little silly, but these people don't know you. And um, if they care about it, then they're not your people. <laughs> okay. And, yeah. 
Um, how do you feel about the ring lights? The ring lights are great. Uh, ring lights are um, so if we were going to use our window light for, let's say you're doing like a live on your Instagram, you can have the window light here and the ring, the ring light in front, and it kind of fills in some of that negative space we're talking about. So it's, it's flattering, it's diffused, it's um, an easy tool and it's cheap. So ring lights are great. Unless you have glasses. Oh yeah, unless you have glasses. <laughs> but glasses, that's, that's a whole nother course. <laughs> yes. Oh yeah, those are helpful too. Mm -hmm. Every little, it's so the great thing about photography is that you can spend as much as you want or as little as you want and still do so much. Um, so if you want the little one because it takes up less space and it's cheaper, still helpful because you're still lighting, you're, you're adding an extra soft diffuse light in front of you. Any other questions? Coach, C-L-O-C-H-E, it's in Durham, it's cute. 